Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. When God shakes your world, because I kind of felt the Holy Spirit tell me that a lot of people are having their world shaken. And, uh, you know, we want to just get some uh, insight from the Word of God on that. So let's have a look in, uh, in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 6 and 7. And uh, this is in the Old Testament, the book of Haggai. It's the season of building the house of God. And uh, thus is the Lord of hosts or Lord of armies. One more time, it's in a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the, land, the sea and dry land. And here it is. I want you to get this verse here. Three things which, which are tremendous hope. Here, number one, I will shake all nations. So God has declared in his word there'll come a time as we get nearer to the end of the world, the, the age and the coming of Christ, he will shake all nations. No one will be spared. Doesn't matter if you're in New Zealand, way down there, or trying to hide out in South Island. God is going to shake all nations. No place you can hide. And then the second thing he says, uh, he says that they shall come to the desire of all nations. Or in other words, he, he says that following that shaking, there'll come an awakening, there'll come a harvest of souls. So we're in the season and to end times now when God is shaking the world, things everywhere are shaking, financial system shaking, governance is shaking, everything is shaking right now. And when that shaking, people become insecure and it opens the way for revival, it opens the way for a harvest of souls. And uh, then he says, then my house will shall be filled with glory. When the glory of God comes, all kinds of miracles come. Phenomenal miracles where there's no one laying hands on people. The power of God is just touching people and supernatural miracles. And we've been starting to see many of these things happen. Uh, we're up in Pakistan before we came here. And uh, in Pakistan, we had 7,000 pastors came together. Never happened ever before to hear of the gospel of the kingdom and the power of God and to see miracles and to be empowered to start to operate in that. We had uh, some open crusades. First, first night, there were 450,000 people. And uh, the second night, 350,000 people in another place. And that's in the middle of just having had uh, a, a, a terrorist attack warnings by the government not to do anything. And the pastor we're working with there, he just said, I'm a man of God. I don't give in to fear. We're going to hold the crusade. And so it was awesome. You know, there were people in Jeeps with guns everywhere. Was San Diego guys would have loved it. You know, the army was out in full force. Everywhere we went, we had armed guards and stuff. But, you know, the big thing is that the miracles we had, we saw uh, 650,000 people decide for Christ. See, we're in the time of God moving. We're in a time of awakening. We've got to believe together for a great harvest. We saw over 500,000 filled with the Spirit, spoken tongues. Hundreds and hundreds of miracles of every kind. This is the coming. This is, we're getting near the time when this is happening globally. A shaking of all nations, the people coming in, the harvest coming in, and the power of God moving in a much greater dimension. So the church has got to be preparing for harvest, activating the folk for harvest, and preparing for miracles as well. Amen? Amen? It's just so good. So here's the thing about uh, sh shaking, is that whenever God shakes us, and there's levels and layers of shaking, and uh, in, in your course of walking with God, He's going to shake your world somewhere. Somewhere, somehow, you're going to have a season when God shakes you. And uh, da King David's life was shaken. In 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6, it tells us that David had come back to his town, Ziklag, his city, and the city had been uh, overcome. His family was gone, wives had gone, money had gone, his, uh, everything had gone from the city, and uh, not only that, all his lead, everyone had gone. And, uh, and now he's in danger also losing his followers, his leaders, because they all spoke of stoning him. And so basically, his whole world is shaken up. Everything that he would draw strength or hope or comfort or, or ability to go forward on, everything had been removed from him. Just in one moment, 
everything is taken away, including the leaders that uh, he had built up and raised up, and now they've turned on him, and they're talking about stoning him because they're so angry at the experience of suffering that they're going through. And it says, but David, David wept. He did, he did these things, very important things to do when your time is shaking. The first thing he did was he wept like everyone else did. He didn't try and pretend that the shaking hadn't hurt him. He didn't try and cover up that the pain was real. He just openly expressed the grief and the pain and the sorrow that he had. It really did affect him. Sometimes I find among Christians, we try to cover and conceal that we really have been very deeply hurt. But under this, yeah, we can do it, we can do it thing, we bury the pain inside. It's not a healthy way to deal with pain. And he wept. But you see, here's the difference. The men around him started to look for someone to blame and someone to get their, their anger out on. He turned to the Lord. He leaned into God in the time of shaking. It says he strengthened himself in the Lord, and then he waited on the Lord for direction. Three things you can do in a time of shaking. Acknowledge the pain and the reality of the shaking, what it's costing you. Secondly, you can strengthen yourself in the Lord, lean into God, and draw deeper into Him. And thirdly, listen to Him for direction. Listen to Him for direction. God spoke to him and said, He talked to him about pursue, overtake, and recover all. And when you, when you look, this is one of the most amazing things about that. Uh, he'd lost everything, family, finances, leadership, the city of refuge, everything like that. But after he leaned into God, the Bible tells us he recovered everything and more. And not only did he recover everything and more, he was positioned where he could give to people that had befriended him and helped him. And then within two chapters, you find that the men of Judah recognize and acknowledge him, and he emerges as king over the tribe of Judah. So you notice there that what looked to be a massive problem actually was a realignment and preparation for promotion. So when you're facing difficulties, when you're facing issues that are going on, you can either be overwhelmed by it or try and survive it, try to do the best you can to get through it, or you can seize what is happening as an opportunity to lean deeper into God, listen to Him, and prepare for your promotion. Prepare for your promotion. I love that. I love that. David's shaking became his preparation for promotion. So when you have a shaking, is this going to have to be done again and again and again? Or will you learn the lesson and not have to go through that kind of shaking again? Think about it. A lot of people, you think, oh my, wait a minute, that's the same issue you were here about a year ago on. What's going on here? Did you not grow? Did you not learn anything? Did you just complain and blame and never shifted and grew? Just went to another church hoping it'll be better and God's there too. <laughs> we go, <laughs> shake you up a bit. You know, God is... There's a, there's a reason, and God's got lots of ways to shake our world. How many know that God is not limited how He can shake your world? He can shake your finances. Oh, that shakes people's world. Oh, when those finances get stuck and people go through the hard time, business went down, something went into recession, the climate change, that's when the world shakes for people. That's when it really shakes for them. It can be a relational conflict. So you've had a long-term relationship, and suddenly there's strife and difficulties and whatever, and that relational conflict can be the shaking of your world. Oh, hello. They went, I felt the air suck out then. <laughs> Obviously, a few people are <laughs> like that. Yeah. can be a family conflict. Just something erupts in the family, and you think, where did that come from? It seems to have come out of nowhere, and it's something that shakes our world. It can be a loss of a job. It can be something that happens in your business or in the church, uh, an or organizational restructure, and your reposition or whatever, and your whole world that you trusted in suddenly gets upheaved. That, that God's got a multitude of ways of shaking our world. He can do it. Uh, betrayal and dishonor in a relationship. When you're betrayed in a relationship, your world is shattered. It shakes enormously to the foundations. If someone experiences a betrayal in a relationship, the pain is enormous because what's happened is your ability to trust is damaged. 
And when your ability to trust is damaged, you begin to question everything. And your whole world shakes and becomes unstable for a little while. And remember, it's when God shakes us, it's never to hurt us. It's always to grow us and promote us. You've just got to choose how you respond. It can be a traumatic experience that we have. Something happened to get through an accident or there's something's happened which was a shock to you and affected you very deeply and your whole world gets shaken by it. It's what you didn't expect. Sometimes it can be an, a, a death or an accident in the family and we never expected it. It was like it didn't enter our thinking that our world would shake up. Today it was fine and tomorrow it's all shaken up. And, and that's the world we're living in now. The world we're living in now is being intentionally dismantled. And so there's going to be crisis after crisis after crisis because it's used to engender fear. And fear, people just want to feel safe. They yield up their rights and they yield up their freedom to just get safe. Just want to be free of being afraid. And we've already seen that. You've seen that. It's extraordinary that so much freedom could be given up without a fuss. Why? Well, there was a shaking going on. And because people were afraid, they just gave up their freedoms. They, they, they chose security over the dilemma of living with fear and insecurity. But, you know, we're, the whole purpose of these things is to lean us into God. It's to lean you into God. And uh, this is where, where people struggle a lot. They don't know what to do. So God's shaking is for several things. So God doesn't cause necessarily things that are unpleasant in our world, but he does use them to shake our world and to do certain things in us. So if we read the same verse and we go into the book of Hebrews chapter 12, they quote the verse from Haggai. Now notice he adds in a little bit, and it's the bit he adds in really helps you see how to respond when you're world shaking. And so we read it in Hebrews 12, 26, and verse 3 to verse uh, 29. Uh, Whose voice, that's God speaking, shook the earth, and now he has promised, saying, it once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. How about that? And he's referring back to when God came and manifested his glory in fire in a visible form, and he shook the earth. And most of the people were terrified. They were afraid to draw near to God. They wanted someone else. You go nearer. You get the word. You come and tell us what God is saying. When this was God's opportunity, their opportunity to draw into a deeper walk with God. God was shaking them. And uh, so he says, I shake not only the earth, but the heaven. And And now this yet once more indicates, and here's the key things. The removal of things that can be shaken or are being shaken as of things that are made so that things that cannot be shaken may remain. Now, get this. What he's saying here is this. God shakes the substitutes we trusted in. He shakes the substitutes we've trusted in. So the things that can be shaken can be removed from our life. And it's not just that God wants to take anything away. He wants that we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken, cannot be moved. In other words, he's saying the things that are unstable inherently, God wants to expose them and remove them so you can become established in things that cannot be shaken. So you can become a people that are not easily shaken. How about that? Remember when God shakes us, he's shaking out the substitutes. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're shaking. Some people need a bit more shaking than others. That's the person next to you. You know it. They're slow learners. They just need a bit more shaking. How about that? So, so in New Zealand, we had, a, uh, we had an earthquake in 1931 in the area we live, and uh, it destroyed pretty well two cities. But what it did was it, it uncovered the foundations of the buildings not being stable, and the building itself not being able to withstand a shaking. But the ones that remained, they modeled the next lot of buildings on those ones that remained. And so, like Napier now is known as an Art Deco city. The reason it's known as an Art Deco city was the Art Deco building stood. 
And so they copied them and made more of them. And then it became an Art Deco city, which now becomes a major tourist feature and attraction of the whole area. We have the, when, the, when they have the, the Art Deco week, which is in February, it's like everyone dresses up in 1930s clothes. The old cars come out in hundreds. There's everything, all these events. It goes on for a whole week of celebrating and partying and, and going through all the living in the past, in, in, a, in essence. But actually, it's like the, the event which shook the city now has become a source of massive income to the region. It's, like, it's, it's amazing how what was a disaster and caused so much destruction has turned. And it's interesting that the thing that makes it a feature is that the things that stood the shaking now have become the attractive core for what, what's happening there. Isn't that amazing? So, so when, a, when, a, when a building when a building is shaken, then what happens is if its foundations are not stable, the building collapses. So the shaking reveals exactly the foundations that the building's been built on. And if the foundations are not solid, then the cracks and damage shows up right through the whole building. And so in Christchurch, when they had a massive earthquake, they had built on sand, and when the shaking came, the sand all liquefied. That means it turned from solid, apparently solid, it became liquid, and then water began to come up, and it spouted out of the ground. And, and, and literally new houses just tilted like that and some of them just broke. Their, their whole concrete platform broke. In other words, when the shaking came, it revealed the foundation the building was built on was unstable and unable to take a testing. So that's quite something, isn't it? So if, if you think about it, when you, if you have a car with rust in it, you can't paint over the rust. If you do the corrosion will just carry, it'll actually destroy it without you seeing it. It gets worse and worse and worse. So if you ever discover rust, you cut the rust out and repair it properly, then you're going to be safe. It's the same when our lives are shaken. The foundations that we trusted in are exposed. The rust in our life is exposed. It's your opportunity to remove it. It's your opportunity to actually become stronger and a more stable person. Think about that. So when God shakes your world, what he's going to uncover is what is in your heart. The Bible says, guard your heart diligently, Proverbs 4.23, whatever's in your heart will express itself in your life, it'll flow out. So these are some of the things that come up when your life gets shaken. Unresolved wounds and trauma. A conflict in the marriage will expose the unresolved hurts from the past from your family, any traumatic experiences you've had, if they're unresolved, a shaking will just expose it. A little bit of conflict, and suddenly what was hidden is out there. It's just all out in the open. Uh, it exposes hidden bitterness. So if your life is shaken and you're bitter, then what will happen is your bitterness will flow out your mouth. So you see with these men, their bitterness showed they started to complain and blame. When the people of Israel came out of Israel, God took them and he gave them a shaking. He just, his shaking in that day, he just, there was no water for three days. Now over there, there's a heap of water, but it's just out of sight. But here, there's no water. And then the water they found was bitter water. So what happened? It grew up to the surface, the bitterness they had from years of living in bondage. And so God allowed them to go through the experience to surface that they were carrying deep bitterness so he could heal it. He showed them, a, they complained, but Moses prayed, turned to God, and God showed him a tree, the cross, which when you put it in the water, made the bitter water sweet. In other words, in the midst of the shaking, the remedy that God had provided become apparent. That they never knew that the cross would heal bitter experiences until that day. It's like the progressive revelation of God. And so we need to recognize that when our life is shaken, don't go blaming, don't go complaining. See what God is trying to do. David grieved and then strengthened himself in the Lord. What is God wanting to do in me? When people get shaken, demonic defilement comes up. If there are demons in their life, they exploit it, and the problems can get really, really very serious. People turn to all kinds of things. When people are shaken, the motivations are shaken up. 
So people look very smooth and smart until they get a bit of a shaking, and then their true motivation is shown. And the shaking could just be as little as, well, I served here and no one thanked me. And suddenly their life is all shaken up by something as little as that, and now the inner motivations of the heart are exposed and brought out. And don't run, don't complain, don't blame, don't get offended. Lean into God, grieve, find strength from God, and see what he wants to say to you. Follow David's pattern. David knew what to do. Okay? When if there are idols in our idols are substitutes we turn to. So when, when your life gets shaken, you will either lean into God or you'll turn to your substitute, whatever your substitute is. So for some, it's they go online, some it's video games, some it's alcohol, some it's pornography. People turn into the thing that helps them manage and medicate the pain rather than leaning into God. Whoa. Okay, you get the idea? So the idols of the heart. Idols are just substitutes for God. And substitutes for God could be your children. Substitutes for God could be your marriage. Substitutes for God could be your job. You could have all kinds of things that you have built your, uh, your life on, and that is the idol. That is what you are yielding to. And when God touches your idol, you'll get angry. As soon as someone's idol is touched, they get furious. They get furious. They get really angry. That's how you can tell. When they get angry, hello, hello, there's an idol in there somewhere. It got touched, just got touched, and uh, it got shaken a little. Don't you love it? See, so you got to shake up the idols, shake them out, see what comes out. And so a little bit of shaking is good for us. See, it's what, it, what's in there. If, you, if you've built your life on lies, so for example, suppose you've grown up and you believe the lie, I'm really of no value, my life doesn't count. That's a lie. Uh, you can tell it's a lie because Jesus paid, gave up his life to actually demonstrate that you are valuable. So it's a lie. But if people believe that lie, when something happens that shakes their world, the lie comes up and they then begin to act out of the lie, become angry, defensive, oppressed, and draw back and away because I'm not valued. In other words, the lie will talk to you because it's demonically energized. And if you don't get free of that, the, uh, the whole purpose of the shaking is to bring to your awareness what's going on inside you. That's why you've got to lean into God and start to come to a place where you grieve over the pain and let it go, but you lean in and strengthen yourself in his faithfulness. And then what is he saying to you? You've got to listen. If we don't listen, how will we know? How will we know what he's saying? And so there's many things. And often there's, there's people and relationships that we've attached to that are not healthy, and they get shaken up in the course of that shaking. So that's what happens in a shaking. All of that stuff comes out. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? How many remember some of it came out on you? It just oozed out the cracks. You couldn't stop it. And you can't recover it because it's already out there. Oh, just pretend it never happened. <laughs> But it happened and we saw it. No, it wasn't me. <laughs> Someone else. It was my wife. So, so you notice there that the, the, the shaking has got three purposes, really. And one of them is it exposes the issues so they can be removed. Two, it's so we have an opportunity to turn deeper into Christ and deepen our relationship with him. And three, so we can establish something unshakable in our life in that area. We receiving a kingdom which is unshakable. You understand? So it's the removing of the things that can be shaken. So when your life is not built on the word of God and attachment to the king, it's inherently not stable. Oh, I got quiet then. Well, well you, you, read, you can read very clearly in the Scriptures, no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So our primary foundation is our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If our life is centered and built on that, on Him, on a person, we can't be shaken. We can't be shaken. He's in, because He says, you know, it says He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change 
you can't shake him. If you lean on him and he becomes the center of your life, then you're not shaken either. They can shake it, but you're stable. That makes sense? So, so one key foundation that we, our life is established on is our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't substitute that for just being a church person. Doing church service does not substitute or make up for your personal relationship. Second thing is the Word of God, the Word of God. See, because we're in a kingdom which has a king, so my relationship with the king is primary, but the Bible says wherever the word of a king is, there is power. Jesus said, if you, the man who was foolish has heard the words and he didn't do them, and so his house was inherently unstable. But the one who hears these words of the culture of the kingdom, the ways of the kingdom, and does them, that man will be the wise man. He, he can stand the shaking. Everyone gets the shaking, but the one that doesn't get moved is the one who is actually attached, not to Jesus loves me, but Jesus is the king. I'm a part of the kingdom, and I lean upon him, and I trust his word. I build my life on the principles of his word. That's where the dilemma is. You find people try to build their life on feelings and experiences and not the word of God. And then the, the third foundation, notice what it says there, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now, the word have means to hold fast or experience. And notice it says, let us get a hold of grace so we can serve God acceptably. Now, that implies without the grace of God, we won't serve God in a way that's acceptable to him. So what does it mean then, get a hold of the grace of God? Well, the grace of God, very simply this, it is power to change. It is power to overcome. Grace is supernatural ability to enable us to overcome sin, temptation, and adversity in life. It is a supernatural empowerment. Think about it. It's the power to serve God in faith and not out of, I'm trying to earn something from him. It, it, see, without, without grace, without the power of God, the works we do are dead works trying to somehow get it right so we're good enough and acceptable enough. But the grace is God's power working through someone who's yielded to the king, yielded to the word, and trusting God to work through us. The grace of God is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do and fulfill the assignment God gave you. Everyone needs the grace of God. In fact, we're, we're commanded or told when you pray, it says, come boldly, boldly. Where? Where do I come? To what? To what? The throne of? Yeah, your throne of grace. So now you've got to, most people know the scripture, but they don't stop to think. We're, we're called not to sort of now head down and shame the coming God. That's not how you come. God wants us to come boldly to the governmental center of all of the kingdom, all over all of creation. We're invited to our Father's throne to obtain mercy if we fail and grace to help us in the time of need. You're invited to come there. You're invited for grace. He says, come, I got the power you need to do what I called you to do. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of grace. So when we talk about grace, it's the Holy Ghost empowerment received by faith. Not trying to just do it in your own strength and your own ability. See? So mostly what people try to do is just manage it in their own strength. You can't do it that way. And so when the shaking comes, you have many, many problems. We cannot just perform our ways, our lives, out of the issues that God surfaces for us. We have to lean upon God and draw upon His grace and power. That's the only way you get through it. You learn to become strong in your spirit because you've drawn on the supernatural life of God through strong praying in tongues. There's a strength God gives. You've got to learn to lean into it, lean on it, and not rely on what you can do. It won't be enough. And it'll always produce striving. So what 
So when you're going through the shaking, a couple of things not to do. Don't try and conceal what's happening. Don't try and perform or struggle your way out of it. It's a shaking with a purpose to change you, to pull up to the surface what you've been hiding, where you're broken, where you're damaged, where you've got secret things. Pull it up and out so you can remove it by prayer and engaging with God and draw strength and grow in that area of your life. Say amen. Amen. So you don't just get busier, 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 frenzy, 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 so I don't stop and ever find out what's going on in my heart. You intentionally stop to find out what's going on in your heart. You make space to see what's emerging in your heart. You do what David did, grieve and weep before the Lord over what's happening. Then strengthen yourself by remembering his word and faithfulness and then lean into him to tell you what to do. Not rocket science, is it really? <laughs> but we actually would rather perform our way out of it. <laughs> or get busy or get distracted or go on a holiday or go drink and wine or do something, anything but face what I'm feeling. And that's the, anything you substitute for dealing with your heart will in the end you'll pay a price for. What you better to do is to turn into the Lord. It says in Psalm 46, 1, Now God, the Almighty One, is our refuge. That means when you're in trouble, you run into Him, not run away from Him. He's our refuge. He's also our strength. He gives ability to overcome. But you've got to run into Him, and He's a very present help in trouble. In other words, He's there. Therefore, we don't need to be afraid. Okay? Second thing, so we start out, when you're in that difficulty and that shaking, you don't just get busier and try to manage it all. You make time, extra time to lean into God because you want to not waste this opportunity. Your promotion could be just beyond it. Why would you get busy and distracted and avoid letting God work in you what He wants to work in you? Does that make sense? So we lean into God. Second thing I found really helpful is to ask the Holy Spirit to search our heart. Psalm 139 verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. In other words, just saying, Holy Spirit, come. Show me where I'm anxious and fearful. Show me the things that I'm not aware of. Bring them up so I can see what they are. See, you know them. And you know me. So, Lord, bring them to the light. Bring them to the open. So, journaling is a great way to get those things up to the open. And then grieve over the losses. There's a, sometimes the things we go through are just so difficult and painful that, that it's important we grieve. You see, because if you grieve, gr- tears are the language of your heart. And if you follow the tears, they'll take you down to what your heart is troubled by. But if you bury the tears... You disconnect from your heart. You're better to be like David who wept openly. And then after that, he didn't stay there. Once he'd wept, he then arose and strengthened himself in the Lord and then heard from God. So that's what I'd call a healthy approach. A healthy approach. Not watching action movies all night. (laughs) Guns and shooting until you're numbed out or drinking till you're numbed out, or getting busy till you're numbed out. None of that solves or resolves anything. It's important we deal with our stuff. And so we grieve over it, and then sometimes we need to forgive someone, sometimes we've got to repent of something. But there are things that God is wanting to do in you now and tonight. And you know what's going on. For many people, it's fear. There's, been, there's fear and anxiety. The message for the last three and a half years has been be afraid. Be afraid and save yourself. That produces fear and anxiety in our lives. There's people here tonight and you're struggling with fear and anxiety. Some of you, that anxiety is in your family. It's come down the family line and now it's at its max. It's starting to really cause a problem in your life. Tonight you need to bring it to the Lord. You need to not run from Him. He's shaking your world. Run into Him and let God help you. For some people tonight, there's offenses. You've been hurt, offended by the failure of people, people you looked up to, people you've trusted, people you've been in a relationship with. 
Offenses close the heart. Offenses stop us engaging God. Offenses disqualify us from moving forward with God. If you're offended in any way tonight, you need to resolve it. Perhaps for other people tonight, the issue is one of disappointments. Your heart is disappointed. You've had so many disappointments. The Lord spoke to me. He said, you're disappointed. You need to face it. I sat down and listed every disappointment I could think of, and there were more than I would have liked. And then he said to me, now I want to teach you about disappointment. He said, one, they accumulate if you don't resolve them. Two, they cause a draining of passion and desire to engage in intimacy. Thirdly, they will erode your ability to trust again, and it'll cause you to draw back from me. And fourthly, he said, the enemy will use it to take you out of your call and assignment. Because when you draw back, you're no longer moving in the grace and power of God. You're now saving yourself. And, and there'll be many people here tonight, and you're struggling with disappointments of all kind. It'll be a great night tonight to be set free of it. There'll be others here tonight, and you've turned to things as a way of coping with the shaking you've got going on. Some may have turned to pornography, some may have turned to alcohol, some may have turned just into media, and you found you're, you're looking to dull the pain because you don't want to go there. Why would you dishonor yourself so greatly? Why would you treat your own heart so badly? If your heart is hurting, bring it to the Lord, who's the healer of the broken heart. Don't bury it and hide it like it's not there. Amen. I believe God wants such a lot of people tonight. And we've got people here tonight who are struggling, and you've got demonic spirits tormenting you, all kinds of things going down. Tonight's your freedom night. Tonight's your time to get free. Tonight's your time to get out of that bondage. Tonight, if God requires something of you, it requires a response. He requires a response. In every shaking, every troubled time, every difficulty, you make a decision whether you run from Him or run to Him. Tonight, we're running to Him. We're running into His presence. We're running forward. We're running to engage with Him. It's not a matter of who's laying hands on you. It's a matter, will you run to the King of Kings and align your life with Him and say, Lord, help me get aligned. I want to rise up and grow and prepare for my promotion. I want to stand in a new authority, and tonight's my night. I want to break out of demonic holds. Tonight's my night. Come on, let's stand. We're going to worship God together. We have a great altar call tonight. Lots of people to be free. I believe good night. God is going to touch so many. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen. For more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.